What's good, y'all? It's Will Ross back at it again with another video. So we're gonna check out Brock Lesnar's first WWE Championship reign. I already know a certain someone would not be uh, too happy about me checking out this video. I already know. But look, I believe someone has sent this to me. And yes, you can say, I don't have to check this out, but I'm not going to sit up here and deny Brock was, he was heavily pushed coming into WWE. And clearly this was the guy Vince McMahon was going to uh, uh, put the company on his back. Pretty much. This was the guy that Vince McMahon saw as the next big thing. And I'm not going to sit up here and say when I first seen Brock and who he was, I was like, yo, who is this? this freak like this dude is ridiculously strong he is throwing people around like it was nothing he was beating people up like they were nothing and they they sold you even though they didn't have to because brock was a legit wrestler a legit, a legit grappler they didn't have to sell you on anything brock was just a guy a freak of nature bro so uh it's i i gotta i gotta show respect you know what I'm saying? When respect is due, <laughs> even though certain people definitely not going to be happy that I checked this out. But we're going to check this out by Wrestling Premiere. Subscribe to Wrestling Premiere if you haven't already. Let's check out Brock Lesnar's first WWE Championship reign and uh, how things uh, kind of got rolling for him. Let's get into it. <laughs> Oh man, it's muted, so y'all didn't hear none of that. We're gonna start this all over again. <laughs> there we go, y'all should hear it now. Brock Lesnar's arrival in 2002 brought a hell of a lot of chaos. He was an impressive specimen in combination of size, speed, agility, and athleticism. Brock's potential hadn't gone unnoticed by WWF who were desperate to bring him up to the main roster. Lesnar's D1 wrestling skills allowed for him to quickly learn about the ins and outs of pro wrestling. His debut and lead up to SummerSlam was one of the most incredible rookie stories WWE has ever told. Mm -hmm. What makes it so good is that Lesnar's push came at an extremely convenient time. In addition, it was fresh. It resembled a golden era type push for a big guy to come in and cause terror. Mm -hmm. Lesnar went from Spike Dudley and Rikishi to the Hardy Boys to Test and RVD to the big guys such as Hulk Hogan and The Rock. Yep. He felt natural. Like, why would a guy who can run as fast as the Hardys throw Big Show over his head look out of place in the main event? If anything, he would look out of place as a mid carter this opportunity was for the taking for Brock Lesnar. Nobody could rival him at the time. Triple H was on Raw. His face run was done. Chris Jericho's title reign was questionable. Mm -hmm. The Undertaker had just lost that title and wasn't going to be the top dog. And then there's Kurt Angle who was being prepared to win the title later on. And most importantly, Rock and Austin were gone. So there was only one choice. Brock Lesnar. Lesnar's title victory over the Rock at SummerSlam marked the beginning <laughs> of a new era. And, when and then this is where uh, <laughs> Dub said, nah, checking out. <laughs> this is where his hatred for <laughs> for the Brock <laughs> stems from <laughs> I always try to tell Dub like Brock was leaving man he was going to Hollywood this this only made sense from a booking standpoint but Dub wasn't trying to hear it <laughs> Looking at it from that time period, it looked like he was about to reign on top of WWE for several years because he was slowly becoming the total package. His promo ability was slowly getting there, and by this time next year, he could talk. But here, he was a rookie who was effortlessly dominating. On the August 26, 2002 episode of Raw, Eric Bischoff introduced the new WWE champion. Paul Heyman bragged about telling the fans so. He's like, oh, I told you so. Lesnar grabs the mic, calls himself the youngest champion in history, and Heyman asked if anyone can beat him, and Lesnar responded with a no. All of a sudden, Shawn Michaels' music played, and seeing that big-ass band-aid will ruin your hopes. It was Triple H. Triple H went on to talk about crippling Shawn Michaels, but then the game shifted his focus to Brock Lesnar and implied mm. that he's inexperienced before asking if he's man enough to play the game. Brock was not budging, but this wasn't his only potential challenger. The Undertaker came out as well. Mm -hmm. He told Triple H that he gets the first title shot as the number one contender, and he asked Lesnar if he was the next big thing or the next big bitch. Mm -hmm. Triple H strikes, and they jump him. After he wanted to make it clear that he won, wanted the match, The Undertaker took advantage and managed to send them walking. Eric Bischoff decided to make a number one contenders match for the title. Triple H versus The Undertaker. Lesnar during the match interfered and cost the American badass the match, giving the title shot to Triple H. The champion was all joyous over this result and it was revealed why. You see, Stephanie McMahon and Eric Bischoff were stealing talent and Stephanie found a loophole to make the champion and championship exclusive to SmackDown. 
And so Eric Bischoff was left without a title. On SmackDown, Stephanie McMahon booked the number one contenders match to determine the challenger for the gold at Unforgiven. Brock Lesnar, meanwhile, destroyed Matt Hardy, who had some fight in him, but ultimately that wasn't <laughs> enough and he lost. He then proceeded to display that brutality that he's known for, and meanwhile, the main event was originally between Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit. Now, it's a triple threat with the newest SmackDown acquisition, The Undertaker. He won the number one contender <laughs> match and what Lesnar desperately tried to avoid. That last round was crazy. At the same time, Brock Lesnar had to focus on the young upstart by the name of Randy Orton. Orton's confidence and ambition somewhat caught Lesnar off guard, but once the match set in, Lesnar shut him down. Later that night, both men went face-to-face -face with Stephanie McMahon moderating this encounter. Lesnar didn't really feel like talking since his accomplishments speak for themselves, but the point of Lesnar here was that everything was easy to him. He's 25 mm -hmm. and he's done a lot. He even asked The Undertaker about his age. The Undertaker, though, saw things entirely different. From a place of experience, he saw a look of confidence on Lesnar's face, the confidence that will have you believing you could beat anybody. The Undertaker said that he's seen this exact same look for a while. He told Brock that he hasn't been tested yet. Unforgiven, he's taken him to a place like never before. He was ready to beat him up, bust him up, and if he survives, then he has something to brag about. Undertaker knew very well that Lesnar hasn't endured the big battles. Paul Heyman praised the dead man for his words, but told him that he's distracted by his family business at home. Heyman was eager to make this about family. For Lesnar, the title is family. Undertaker, though, has to take care of his pregnant wife, and Stephanie didn't want him to make things personal. Heyman, though, was all about that. He mm -hmm. said that he'll take care of his wife, but not his unborn child, and things escalated. Mm -hmm. Good segment. I like the idea mm -hmm. here with the lights dimmed and both men getting to hear the other speak. It made things feel big time. It felt like a huge main event that was going to happen. It's crazy how... Brock and The Undertaker had a, a good, like, like feud early in his career. And then even later on down the road, they returned back to that feud. And it was still pretty good. That's And the fact that The Undertaker most of the time put over Brock. That's the crazy thing. He put him over. Like, that was everybody's job to put him over. Man, he didn't have to. He was already, like, this, this larger-than-life character. But that's... Everyone, for the most part, was doing the job for Brock because it made sense to do the job for Brock. So. Soon. And the story was clear. Rookie who's in over his head, thinking he's good enough, and an experienced veteran who saw all of them come and go. To him, it was just another guy, except this time, he has a title. The feud was slowly heating up and turning personal. Meanwhile, Brock Lesnar had that famous match with Hardcore Holly, and after an awkward sequence, Lesnar dropped him on his neck, and Hardcore was left mm -hmm. sidelined for a year. The Undertaker, on the other hand, had to deal with Matt Hardy. His wife was in the back, and Lesnar used this to his advantage. Heyman did one of those distractions, and Taker fell for it, and boom, Lesnar with a brutal chair shot. He ends up touching the baby and saying, life's a bitch. The two men knew that Goon and Emerald and Taker was going to haunt them, so they brought security. Come to think of it, it was more Heyman who was paranoid. Lesnar was spending too much time on John Cena while Heyman was telling him to hurry up. Lesnar was distracted by... Absolutely nobody, and I'm not talking about John Cena. You know, he's kind of worried about The Undertaker coming out, but he wrapped it up. Heyman was still begging him to leave, but Brock was cool staying around. Then he realized, hey, Undertaker could be in the parking lot, so why would I leave the arena and ruin the match Unforgiven? The dead man arrived at the end of the show and called out Lesnar, threatening to come after him in the locker room. Was Brock scared of him? <laughs> no. no. He shoved Heyman out of the way, and it was on. Lesnar <laughs> had him he did something, but Undertaker was going all out. Matt Hardy suddenly comes in, and Lesnar goes to the outside. He takes a beating. And the champion was put under protective custody, and The Undertaker was pissed. Okay, the build for the match was intense, already personal, and it's not the best build because the story doesn't need to be that personal, but yeah. whatever. This was Brock Lesnar's ultimate test. Besting Hulk Hogan and The Rock is no easy feat, but one is old, and the other was on his way out. What about the guy in his prime and is here to stay? That's the story. The promo for the match was absolutely amazing. They had the Adrenaline song by Gavin Rosdale. I think you guys may have heard it in the Triple X movie. It's hype. If you've never seen it before, you should go search this promo. It's really one of the best promos from this era of WWE. Brock won the Marcus territory. And, and it's crazy. WWE, even though they, they still make some good promos depending on the storyline, like what's happening. Like the Bloodline promo package, man, when it's all said and done, when we finally get to the very, very end, it'll be one of the greatest promo packages they ever put together because they have so much footage. But WWE... One thing they're good at is making very good, legendary, iconic promo packages with great songs to go with them, man. So that that don't even sound far-fetched at all. Well, that he wasn't scared, but the vibe from this match was Brock and Storyline had a lot to learn. The dead man took early control, and Lesnar had to rely on help from Heyman on the outside to take advantage. He was in full force, though. He was benefiting from Heyman on the outside, and in addition, a bloody Undertaker. But the taste of his own blood only caused the Undertaker to go super crazy. He had the yep. match win at one point, but the ref was down, and so Matt Hardy interfered. 
It took a last try to lessen the damage, but it still wasn't enough. Heyman was slowly believing this guy was unable to put a stop to the dead man, and so was the crowd. He brought in a chair, but it wasn't even used on the right guy because the Undertaker grabbed it and went swinging. These chair shots were brutal, and you expect nothing less from Undertaker. But at this point, even Lesnar was showing resiliency. He refused to let go of that title, though at this point, he only had his fingertips on it. Lesnar's F5 was countered, and once again, the ref was involved. So he put his hands on him and caused the DQ. It was more than the title for the Undertaker. Multiple referees tried to separate both men, but it wasn't working, and the challenger managed to hit a choke slam, and things settled for all two seconds because the Undertaker grabbed <laughs> Lesnar and tossed him through the stage. Good match. Both men. Yeah, were and the crazy thing is nobody technically lost because they weren't trying to have anyone lose yet. Obviously, they were going to build a feud out of this. The immovable force and the uh, the you know, I think that I said it wrong. The I said immovable force, the unstoppable force, and the immovable object colliding. Who's going to give in? You know what I'm saying? So I get why they didn't initially have anyone really win this match definitively. They just kind of had them still go out on their own merits. It was great, especially Lesnar who wasn't afraid of the Undertaker and was throwing everything at him. Undertaker looked like the vengeful family man who was eager to make Lesnar pay for his sins. And with an ending like that, it was clear that this feud was far from over. Later that week on SmackDown, Funaki wanted to conduct an interview with the champion. Lesnar was asked if it was true that he refused to give the Undertaker a rematch. And he responded saying that this is a question everyone was scared to ask him, so he wanted to answer it in the ring. Funaki was excited about the interview, unaware of what's to come. <laughs> he brought up the chair that the Undertaker used to <laughs> Lesnar beat him up. Bro almost sent him God damn! He like a helicopter with this F5. He followed up later that night with the Undertaker and dropped him with the belt, and he still refused to face him. Stephanie, though, said that the Undertaker is going to get a rematch with the stipulation. Heyman tried to get the stipulation out of her, but they had to wait. Meanwhile, Taker's match with Matt Hardy turned into an ambush, and Lesnar wasn't going to let him go so easily. This led to Matt Hardy scoring the victory, but the champion wasn't done. Yep. He blasted the Undertaker's hand with a propane tank, and as a result of his actions, the hand was broken. Stephanie informed him of this news, but told him that the Undertaker insisted on the rematch. They made jokes about his hand, and then Stephanie told him that it's going to be inside hell in a cell, and the mm -hmm. hope and excitement in Heyman's eyes yep. made it. The Undertaker was eager to rebound, but Matt Hardy only made the problem worse. Lesnar and Heyman Bro, still to Matt was the bane of fucking Undertaker's existence. Matt Hardy was just annoying this nigga. Press the dead man in a totally different way, so they decided to bring an unknown woman, his ex. Just as she's about to speak, he interrupts. The others ran and she started airing some dirty laundry claiming she didn't know Taker was married. She tried to paint him as an adulterer and he shouted that he didn't know her. She slapped him and the tactic was working exactly like Lesnar and Heyman intended. But I wasn't over though for Brock. He had a team up with Tajiri in a tag team tournament, and they didn't win due to Tajiri, but Lesnar was the only one left standing. The Undertaker ran in afterwards, and despite feeling a lot of pain using that cast, he did it anyway, <laughs> and sent Brock running. Before No Mercy, he offered his rebuttal towards that woman. Taker admitted that he lied about knowing her, but acknowledged that he knew her years before he met his wife. He said the hell he's been through was nothing compared to what Brock's gonna go through. Heyman was still looking for ways to even the playing field and complained to Stephanie about The Undertaker wrestling with the cast. As for what he thought about it, he was pissed. He refused to see that woman again and demonstrated what that cast could do. He fouled up going after Lesnar and the champion had to make a run for it. At this point, Paul Heyman was insisting. He refused to see Undertaker with that cast on inside Hell in a Cell. It was becoming more and more likely that the decision would go their way. And at the end of the night, Stephanie brought out Lesnar and made her decision. She revealed that the Undertaker can wrestle with the cast. Now, I don't know if he's interested in shampoo, but one thing for sure around here is that The Undertaker was right behind him. Even Heyman took a beating as well. And with this attack, the momentum had swung in The Undertaker's favor. The build, once again, was odd. With the woman coming in and, and mm -hmm. accusing The Undertaker of stuff, they didn't need that when they had the cast storyline. With that said, who cares about the build? Let's talk about the match. Yep, hell in a cell, man. <laughs> it's iconic. Yep. This is iconic for multiple reasons. For one... The promo of the match was once again great, but the match was even better. The Undertaker mm -hmm. in his home, the match he made famous against a rookie who doesn't know much about this environment. Yep. That's the story. The next big thing was humble. He was out of his element and Paul Heyman couldn't do anything about it. Instead, he could receive it. As time went on, Brock finally adapted to his surroundings and dished out. He removed that cast that made the hand useless for the Undertaker who was writhing in pain. The match entered the intense part and man, it was off the charts. The Undertaker seemed likely to win it. And the momentum was in his favor, but then Lesnar just grabs him off the tombstone counter and hits an F5, F5 to yep. retain the title. Iconic match. Really helped establish Brock Lesnar as a man. That yeah, once that happened, I was like, okay. I mean, we're already full force youngest uh, champion at this point, beating Legends. Beating The Undertaker in a hell in a cell, this young in your career, 
Yeah, all, all cylinders are firing. It, he's he's their guy. <laughs> this wouldn't stop. It was a performance from both men that deserves more love. It's not underrated. It just should be appreciated more because this is one of the greatest Hell in a Cell matches of all time. For Brock, it's his favorite match from his first WWE run. He had so much respect and appreciation for The Undertaker working for him. Mm -hmm. And they were two entirely different people, but they connected inside that squared circle. Yeah. And as I said earlier, this match made Brock Lesnar the guy. The pose atop the Hell in a Cell with the Fallen Undertaker is nothing short of amazing. Mm -hmm. Later that week on SmackDown, The Undertaker came out and called out the champion. Paul Heyman looked tired of this, but Brock came out. Taker admitted that the thought in his mind was his broken hand cost him the match, but he came to the conclusion that it's no excuse. Brock had his number. Five years ago, even if everything was injured, he would have beaten his ass. And no mercy, though, it didn't matter. But long story short, Undertaker said that he's being the best. Sunday, though, Brock was the best. The dead man was very hostile, but Brock just wanted to talk. He said that about Sarah, it was supposed to be business and stared deeply into Heyman while saying that. He said that he needed an edge and walked away. Then Big Show proceeded to come out and throw The Undertaker off the stage, but that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But for Brock, when you beat the big Undertaker as a heel, it's hard to follow up because just about anyone he faces from here is inferior. Yeah. Enter The Big Show. Now, yeah. The Big Show had a... And that was just another way to get him over, like, yeah, you, you really that guy. He really was that guy. It, it wasn't even close. And then you can tell they were going to start switching, switching him over to a baby face. They were going to start switching him over to a baby face because the Big Show obviously was coming in as a heel here. And Brock went into the program with The Undertaker as a heel. But after The Undertaker gave him respect and Brock kind of, you know, giving him that same type of respect back. Yeah, you can tell they were switching, switching his character. Very uneventful 2002. This was their way of turning things around with him, but it didn't seem a likely challenger. It was supposed to be the Hulkster. Hulk Hogan's return earlier that year had marked a point in his career where he was given back. He was taken out by Brock Lesnar right before SummerSlam and selling the injuries. Naturally, his return was imminent with the Hulkster actually believing in real life, not in storyline, that he had a chance to beat Brock. I think he finally understood what mid Carter's feel and thought, <laughs> I want to go back to 1988. Because this man lost a hell of a lot of matches. Not that many compared to others, though. Brock Lesnar spoke about this in his book, Death Clutch, back in 2010. And I quote, My next opponent after Undertaker was originally supposed to be Hulk Hogan. Vince wanted to do a storyline where Hogan was looking to settle the score in the Lesnar vs. Hogan match would air live from Madison Square Garden as the main event of Survivor Series 2002. I'd be headlining yet another pay-per-view. Vince wanted Hogan to look really good but fall short of beating me for the title. I mm -hmm. guess the old Hulkster didn't like that idea too much and the next thing I know, we were going with Plan B, the big show. Hulk bro, that sounds definitely like Hulk Hogan, bro. That That's right around the time, though, with the whole Shawn Michaels situation. He didn't... Want, he only wanted to have one match with Sean, and he wanted to go over. I believe it was at SummerSlam. He wanted to go over, and then that was it. <laughs> it was right around that area, that that pocket of time where like the Hulk didn't want to do the job. It was supposed to be like a series of matches with Sean, where Sean would lose, and then Sean would get another win, and maybe they have like a rubber match or whatever. But the Hulk was like, "Nah, I, I want to win. I don't. <laughs> that don't make any sense." That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense for the Hulk, Hulk Hogan to be that young up and coming star that's at the top of the card. He's supposed to be doing the job. Hulk didn't want to do the job for damn near nobody when he came back, bro. Hogan really thought he would win the title. Like, bro, sit down. No. It's just crazy. Like, in the year of 2002, he got his championship run, but it's time to move forward. Like, yeah. He's always going to be around. It was just in this moment, it was Brock Lesnar's time. His book was releasing at the time, and it made sense to promote it. But these issues with Vince led to him leaving the company. Yep. It wasn't a huge departure because nobody watching the show saw any reference to a potential return for him. But for Brock, it's a bit of a downgrade because this wasn't 2003 Big Show who was well reestablished. This was a guy who wasn't even on the WrestleMania card that year. So rebuilding Big Show was the challenge. Yeah. It wasn't even going to be that hard because, well, look at him. Yeah. The Big Show followed up by barging into Brock Lesnar's locker room and Heyman started rambling on. He begged Big Show not to demand a title shot so soon, but Brock tossed him to the side and with zero fear gave Big Show the title shot. Paul tried to tell Lesnar that this was going to be a tough challenge because he can't use his regular offense on him. He straight up told him that he can't beat the Big Show. That's why mm -hmm. he's an agent. To make decisions for people like Brock. Big Show, on the other hand, was provoking Brock hard to the point where he called him Little Man. And after the commercial break, the champion came out. This took a couple of minutes after Big Show said Brock couldn't beat him and his manager knows it. And the champion agreed with Big Show that he's a giant. A giant piece of Big Show said that he's been advised not to beat Brock up until Survivor Series. And Taz was confused. It was clear that they were implying something. As for Brock, he had to deal with Rey Mysterio. And this is when the number one contender 
took advantage. He threw Ray into the crowd and dominated <laughs> the champion. He sent him to the announce table. And Big Show stood tall to end the Bro, show on top. Ray Rock got dis- though, and he wasn't Rock, looking- break. Ray got disrespected. Get your bum ass out of here, Ray. Ah! <laughs> Let this little issue ruin him. He was certainly rattled, but confident. He was breaking his TV in anger of Big Show. Heyman, though, saw it differently. He didn't want Brock facing Eddie Guerrero, especially after last week. But the next big thing didn't care. This was after a long-ass tirade from Heyman, who desperately wanted to instill in Lesnar's mind that he can't beat the Big Show. He refused to walk out there with Brock, and the champion gets the job done. But right afterwards, Big Show threw him off the stage. On the final SmackDown before Survivor Series, Paul Heyman assured everyone that Brock Lesnar, who was advised by his doctor not to appear, won't be on the show. Big Show told him that regardless of that, he's calling him out. To the surprise of nobody, Lesnar was in the arena. Yeah. He was selling a rib injury, although reports from the time claim it's legit. That's possibly why they cut off the time from the match. Or it was just to sell the injury to make things much, much easier for Big Show and Storyline. He got into a little argument with Heyman, who wanted to be protective of Brock, but felt that he should be doing more with him. You know, the team works. You should be putting an effort in listening to him. Heyman wanted the best for him, and he begged him to put his pride aside. Him going out there isn't going to end well, but Paul had an idea. He walked into Big Show's locker room and told him that he's the guy that wants his opponent at 100%. Basically, he just wanted him to back off until Survivor Series. He was begging him not to call out Brock Lesnar. Big Show said that Heyman's the best thing for Lesnar and considered his plea, but sees the possibility of going through and calling him out. Now that was solved, Brock was the big issue. Heyman made it seem like Big Show listened to him and he thought all was good, but then Brock's like, I'm not leaving. And he started complaining, he's like, why are you not? And the champion told him that if he's not getting called out, he's going to call out the Big Show. At the end of the night, Lesnar with zero fear called out the Big Show. Heyman had enough, <laughs> but he was unable to silence the beast. The Big Show came out, and this bro was chaotic. Mm-hmm. He thought his jobber days were past him, but Brock nah, took him on a stroll bro. down memory lane. The bro, champion was ready. he beat the crap out of him. I, I bro, that chair shot was crazy. I think this is where he, at, he hit him. Against the steps, and I think Big Show form got legitimately cut, like it was a gash, and that chair shot. Ooh, <laughs> he cracked him. Ready for Survivor Series, he destroyed the Big Show, busted him open, but even then, Paul Heyman still doubted him. Despite this, he promised to do everything he can so his he client could leave. Cracked his him. Okay, bro. I like the build for this match. Brock Lesnar was leaning towards being a face and was basically unlocked. Big yeah. Show was reheated after Hogan's departure, and it worked very well for him. Right in the beginning, Lesnar went to Big Show's face and learned what he was all about. Even then, the champion displayed some of that offense he was known for and was dominating Big Show like he was a cruiserweight. He was definitely not used to selling like this. The ref got knocked down at one point, and Heyman tossed in a chair. Lesnar uses a chair and hits the F5, but Heyman pulled the ref out of the ring, and yeah. once Brock realized what's up, Heyman made a run for it, leading to the choke slam on the chair. Yeah. One, two, two three. three, new champion. Quick match, it did its job with Lesnar looking extremely good out there. Mm-hmm. He manhandled the Big Show, but the result is kind of questionable. Now, the result of the match is somewhat shocking, but you have to understand that they were thinking long-term with this one. Brock Lesnar was positioned as the face of the company. His role was to be the number one guy, and when WrestleMania comes up, you don't usually see the face of the company as the champion, especially in this era. In yeah. all the WrestleMania, Stone Cold won the main event. He was going into it without the title. Mm-hmm. He was chasing, and the chase is always dramatic and cool. So Lesnar losing made sense. As for the big show, he turned out to be a good transitional champion. It couldn't have been Kurt Angle because at the time, the match between himself and Brock was already booked, and up to this point, they had never faced each other in a match. So that's why Brock lost here. Okay, yeah. this was a good title reign. Brock Lesnar, he doesn't need to talk. He does his work in the ring. His actions speak for themselves. Facts. And that's what they did here. I really love O2 Brock Lesnar because of how hungry he seemed compared to others. Like, this guy was just unique in every way compared to everyone else on the roster. He comes in. He's booked to destroy everybody. But the way he goes about it is what makes him so good. The man was massively talented. And it felt like he had a lot of years ahead of him at this point. But little did they know. The best match of this yeah. tuttering was definitely Hell in a Cell with mm-hmm. The Undertaker. That's the one, you know, like, it was just so damn good. It established Lesnar as the star, you know. He already had some great moments with Hogan, The Rock. But this match, like, cemented that this guy is here to stay. We are mm. going to push him for years to follow. Yep. Yeah. All right, what would you guys think of Brock Lesnar's title reign? Please comment down below. And that's- hey, man, I, I can be objective. His first title reign was not that bad at all, considering he was young and fresh in the business he did pretty damn good for himself if there was no denying it no denying it at all so i know <laughs> a certain someone definitely would not be happy about me uh checking this video out but once again i am i'm i'm gonna be objective you know what i'm saying whether i i feel that way now that's neither here nor there but i i can be objective when i say 
back in Brock's early days when he was definitely wanting to be there, he was putting in the work. He was putting in the grind. And I can only respect that. So comment down below. Let me know how do you guys feel about Brock Lesnar's first WWE title reign. Did you enjoy it? Did you hate it? Why? Why not? Let me know down below. Also, once again, subscribe to Wrestling Premiere. Uh, his channel link to the original video will be down below in the description. But I appreciate all the love and support you guys shown on channel road to 150k. Now I'm still going to be the YouTube wrestling champion of the world. Appreciate y'all kicking me. See you on next one. Peace.